Dear friends, Jesus said to his friend Peter, On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. This day we are bound together in worship wherever we are. Know that you are not alone. Know that you are in the company of this church, this community, and you are in the company of the Holy Spirit. In celebration and recognition of that togetherness, let's begin worship by just centering ourselves, breathing out, and breathing in. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Please join me in the call to worship using the words displayed on the screen and in today's bulletin. If it had not been the Lord who was on our side, let all the people say, if it had not been the Lord who was on our side, they would have swallowed us up alive. The world is overwhelming. Blessed be the Lord who has not given us over to it all. All is not lost. Day by day we move forward in trust and in hope, even in the most difficult times. Our hope, our help, is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Let us say it again 
as we worship together. Our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Please join me in the act of confession. Friends, why do we confess our sin? Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But why do we do this together? Because we are a community, a covenant people. Then let us confess our sin. God of all life, you created this world and all we see and know. You knit us together in our mother's wombs and you call us into communities for support and service. But we persist in clinging to the illusion that we must do this by ourselves. We retreat into our own corners when things get hard. We would rather suffer alone and not let anyone know what is going on inside. Forgive us for thinking this is a path to be walked alone. Forgive us for not reaching out for ourselves or toward others. Send your Holy Spirit to nudge us ever more fully towards each other, especially when we need it most. Comfort us with knowing how you bind us together in love. In Jesus' name, amen.
hear the good news. This is a season, I suspect it's for you like it is for me, full of regrets. Things I wish I had done, things I know I wish I had done differently, things that needed to have been left to set aside. But it is good news that Christ holds all of those things in grace. All of those things are held in grace and mercy and love. Friends, hear and believe the good news of the gospel that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be world without end. Amen. Amen. Good afternoon, friends. It's Dana Lang and I again to give you a sense we're making really, really wonderful progress. Think about this patio, which is nearly complete. How valuable, even more valuable than we thought it was going to be. Um, but come inside this wonderful space with us. Okay, I'm going to show you what it will be like when you want to get a meal here. You'll come through, there'll be a line here for you to line up, and then you'll come around, and right here in the kitchen will be a long counter and you can get your food, head out to the fellowship hall, enjoy your meal, and when you're done, you will bring your plates back here. There's going to be a trash station here. When you're finished with your plate, you're gonna give it to a nice member who's gonna work in the dish room. Soon, that will be completed. Just to get a little tour of the kitchen, if you're a lucky person who gets to work in the kitchen, this is gonna be a work area here. And right here, underneath our giant hood, will be the stoves and ovens. And this is our huge pantry. One other nice addition to the fellowship hall, more storage and modern bathrooms. Hard to imagine. If you've never seen the men's room, this is what it looks like. Water fountains, even ones for kids. A ladies room, six stalls, no waiting. And here we are in the giant fellowship hall. Look how little Chris looks in this big giant room. This is amazing. This is amazing. It is such a gift. It is, it is really, really wonderful in here, friends. And I look forward to an opportunity to, hopefully some point not too late into October, being able to welcome you into this space in a way where we can walk in very carefully so you can see this yourself. This has happened because of the pledges you have made, and that is a tremendous, tremendous thing. Uh, we are grateful for all the gifts you had already given, and if you have a pledge outstanding, it would be really wonderful if you could pay, it, pay that off by the time this project ends in October so that we don't have to take on additional financing so that we can complete this entire project. Your pledges, your commitments, your gifts, those things really, really, really matter. I'm grateful to you for the vision to see this kind of place, um, but also for all you're doing in this strange and complicated time. What a joy it'll be to be together in here, friends. Hello, uh, now is the time for um children's message. So if you uh, identify as a child, I would ask you to get comfortable and just listen extra close for the next couple of minutes because I'm talking especially to you. 
get somewhere where you can see the screen too, because I, I wanted to show you something that I made recently. Um, I made a tiny little basket. Now, don't laugh. It, it's uh, it's a little lopsided, and here on the bottom, there's light shining through. You can kind of see. Um, <laughs> so uh, it's my first one, and uh, I'm not really good at making baskets yet, but I hope to be better. So how did I make this basket? Well, I made this basket out of pine straw. And whether you know it or not, you have seen pine straw because there's pine straw on the playground outside at the church. It smells really good. Mm, that's my favorite part about this basket. It still smells like, um, like a pine forest, um, which is a special thing. Um, and so I took a bunch of pine needles and I um, would put like 10 or 12 of them together and then I would wrap twine around it. You can see where I wrapped the twine right here. So what used to just be like a little piece of straw, you know, not very big, not very, uh, you know, kind of weak. It's not going to hold anything. Now it's joined together with a bunch of other things and you can put things in it. Uh, I have a little cedar branch that I keep in here, and my wife um, puts jewelry in there. It usually sits in our bedroom. Um, when I get better at making baskets, here's what I'm going to do differently. I'm going to include more pine straw so it gets bigger, so I can put uh, lots of other cool things in there. I might use it to hold, um, I don't know, apples, books. depends on how big uh, I make it. Um, but also, this is the big one, I'm going to make it a lot tighter. I'm going to put the pine needles closer together to make it stronger. Because you see, it's a little bit flimsy. If I put too many things in here, the bottom would just break out. Or if I put something really small, like if I tried to, uh, to eat my cereal out of this, uh, all of the milk would, would flow out. Um, if I try to put rice or something in here, uh, then it would just fall out the bottom and I wouldn't have any rice anymore. So I am going to try to put the needles closer together. I want you to think about baskets this week, and I want you to think about what it means to live close together. I want you to think about how when we humans, just like pine needles, all like bunch up and get close together, when we work towards something together, when we take care of each other, when we share, um, we're so much stronger than if we try to do that alone. In just a minute, our friend Linda is going to read a story from the book of Exodus in the Bible. And in that Bible, there is a basket. And they use the basket to save a baby's life. Now, a baby would not fit into my basket, and uh, I wouldn't want to put this basket in the water because the water would get in. But baskets are capable of great things, and so are we when we work together. So um, I hope you like my basket. It's okay to laugh. It's a little lopsided, but uh, I'll show you my next basket when I make it, and uh, yeah, pray for me while I'm working on it. Let's, let's pray together right now. Lord, you put so many good things into us. You give us our sense of humor, and you give us our imagination. You give us our strength, and you give us, uh, you even give us our anger sometimes. We pray that everything that you put into us will be used for good. We pray that everything that you put into us, we can learn to be thankful for. And we pray that you will teach us how to work together so that we can be stronger and so that we can make the world into a happier, more beautiful place to live. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for um, talking about my basket with me. I will see you all soon. As we approach God's word, let us pray for the spirit to illumine our hearts and our minds. Living God, help us so to hear your holy word that we may truly understand 
that in understanding we may believe, and in believing we may follow in faithfulness and love through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our scripture reading comes from Exodus chapter 1, verse 8, through chapter 2, verse 10. Now a new king arose over Egypt, who did not know Joseph. He said to his people, look, the Israelite people are more numerous and more powerful than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, where they will increase. And in the event of war, join our enemies and fight against us and escape from the land. Therefore, they set taskmasters over them to oppress them with forced labor. They built supply cities, Pitim and Ramesses for Pharaoh. But the more they were oppressed, the more they multiplied and spread, so that the Egyptians came to dread the Israelites. The Egyptians became ruthless in imposing tasks on the Israelites, and they made their lives bitter with hard service in mortar and brick and in every kind of field labor. They were ruthless in all the tasks that they imposed on them. The king of Egypt said to the Hebrew midwives, one of whom was named Shipra and the other Puah, when you act as midwives to the Hebrew women and see them on their birth stool, if it is a boy, kill him. But if it is a girl, she shall live. But the midwives feared God. They did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but they let the boys live. So the king of Egypt summoned the midwives and said to them, Why have you done this and allowed the boys to live? The midwife said to Pharaoh, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are vigorous and give birth before the midwife comes to them. So God dealt well with the midwives and the people multiplied and became very strong. And because the midwives feared God, he gave them families. Then Pharaoh commanded all his people, every boy that is born to the Hebrews, you shall throw into the Nile, but you shall let every girl live. Now a man from the house of Levi went and married a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a fine baby, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she got a papyrus basket for him and plastered it with bitumen and pitch. And she put the child in it and placed it among the reeds on the bank of the river. His sister stood at a distance to see what would happen to him. The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her attendants walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her maid to bring it. When she opened it, she saw the child. He was crying, and she took pity on him. This be, must be one of the Hebrews' children, she said. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and get you a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Yes. So the girl went and called the child's mother. Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed it. When the child grew up, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and she took him as her son. She named him Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Every night when I was little, I would fall asleep listening to Bible stories on cassette tape. A babysitter, her name was Miss Virginia, had given me a full set. The tapes were yellow and they had red writing on them. And my favorite was the one that told the story that we just heard, of baby Moses in the basket. Not only was it my favorite Bible story, uh, at the time it might have been my favorite story, period. 
There was something very, very different about this story than the ones that I was used to hearing. I was used to hearing about Superman and Batman and Ninja Turtles. And while the story of Moses and the basket is exciting, the excitement is different. It's more complex. It's more subtle. I would say more true to life. The story begins with immense horror. In the first five verses, Hebrew people are enslaved, forced into exceptionally cruel labor by the king of Egypt, who we read profits tremendously from exploiting his workers. Motivated by fear and paranoia, the king institutes a policy of infanticide. He attempts to kill all the Hebrew baby boys because he thinks there are just too many Hebrews. He knows that he has done them wrong, and he's worried about the consequences. So far, this could be like any other story we're used to hearing. An evil king comes along, oppresses people, does horrible things. We've heard this story before, right? This is when a hero is supposed to come along, overthrow the king, take the crown, rule the kingdom with nobility and kindness, and everybody lives happily ever after. But that is not how this story goes. There is no dashing hero in this story, no Robin Hood to save the day. Instead, there are four Hebrew women and a basket. Through the bravery and sacrifice of midwives, of a mother and her daughter, Moses lives. So this is a story about survival. It's a story about love. Part of what makes this story so unique is that we don't hear stories about baskets very often. Baskets are deceptively benign. They are light and made of simple materials. They are unexciting, mundane, everyday items that we overlook unless we're filling them with laundry or produce from the garden or earrings. (laughs) Because of this, baskets have not worked their way into the collective imagination in the way that other objects have. The human story is usually told through harder things, things with points, like arrows and spears and swords. We talk about the Stone Age and the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, and the stories we tell fit into this same logic. When it's time to talk about history, we talk about heroes, individuals, usually individuals who are men, Men who slay dragons, kill kings, win wars, vanquish all their foes. Thor had a hammer, Hercules swung a club, King Arthur had Excalibur. And compared to all these storied weapons, baskets are forgotten. But interestingly enough, baskets are some of our oldest technology. Without baskets, we would not be here. We know that early humans would go out to fields and pastures and sit beside streams and collect seeds. They would then place these seeds into their baskets. That's where most of their calories came from. The fossil records suggest that our ancestors only managed to kill a woolly mammoth once every couple of generations. It was a big deal of that if that uh, was able to happen. That's why it made its way onto so many walls of caves. It was worth celebrating and people would talk about it for a long time. In the meantime, ordinary people collected grain. They gathered food one tiny seed at a time for tens of thousands of years. This is how human civilization was born. This is our heritage. And it was a profoundly boring time in human history. We forget this legacy. It's hard to tell exciting stories about baskets. So we stop talking about communities and their baskets. And instead, we tell stories about individuals and their swords. 
Stories about heroes may possess the ability to inspire, but they also present us with a distorted idea of how the world works. We tell stories about a stalwart individual who, when there's trouble, does the right thing, pushes ahead alone, and against all odds, saves the day. But the hero always looks like someone else. The hero is always taller, always more handsome, always stronger, always more eloquent. We look at heroes and we say, I can never be like him. And so, instead of doing anything about a problem, we wait around for a hero to arrive. No matter what the stories we've heard say, in real life, heroes aren't the ones who change things. Real change happens when people work together. Through phone calls, committee meetings, conversations, partnership, compromise, collaboration, real change happens through lots of tiny little actions that seem invisible and insignificant when they're happening, but over time make a big impact. Real, meaningful change happens through connection. Real, meaningful change happens through community. One of my favorite words is conspiracy, which taken literally, con, inspire, it means to breathe together, which is beautiful. So let's consider, let's go back to the text and consider the conspiracy that saved baby Moses. Two midwives, ordinary working women, are given the abhorrent task of killing children so they conspire to resist. And then, when Moses' mother gives birth, she manages to hide her child for three months. Now, I don't know a lot about babies, but I do know that they are not easy to hide because they cry and they smell. (laughs) Uh, Hiding a baby is the kind of work that requires neighbors you can trust, people willing to share your burden, people who understands that we can overcome Pharaoh's violence only when we work together. Which brings me back to the topic of baskets. When you get a chance, find a basket and take a close look at it. Look at how it's made. What was once an individual piece of pine straw or sweet grass is now bound tightly to hundreds and thousands of others of individuals. And in this binding, they are made strong. And in this binding, they are made beautiful. The strength of a sword is obvious, but the strength of a basket is much more subtle. Like Moses' mother and like the midwives, they are deceptively strong. Their strength comes from their ability to bend and flex. Baskets can adapt. Their strength comes from individual pieces of grass distributing the weight and supporting one another. By themselves, reeds bend and break. But when they're joined together by a capable weaver, baskets can last a long, long time. Archaeologists, it turns out, I found this out on Wikipedia, have found baskets in the Nile River Delta, that they believe to be 10,000 years old. Swords pierce and slice and cut, but baskets can hold loaves of bread to feed a multitude, and baskets can hold a child that needs to be protected. Shaped by Christ and bound together by the Holy Spirit, this church is a basket. As individuals, we are beautiful and worthy children of God. But as a community, we are a vessel capable of carrying Christ's love into the world. Our best work, the things we do that are the most meaningful, are not accomplished through one person's strength or vision or charisma. 
the work that we do that is the most long-lasting and the most worthwhile is labor that we share in together, labor we engage in side by side. The work of bearing the gospel into the world is too weighty for an individual to do by themselves. Paul had Silas, Mary had Joseph and Elizabeth, Peter had Andrew and James and John and a bunch of other folks. We have one another. This community, this conspiracy, this church, Together, we are the heroes that we have been waiting for. We are the saints who possess a unique and sacred expression of who God is, a vision that could not come into being without us and will never be found again. So, I suggest we start telling basket stories. I am less interested in seeing another Batman movie and more interested in seeing a movie about the people of Gotham City working together to fight crime without a need for superheroes. Um, Not many people would buy tickets to that movie, but (laughs) I would. Um, I'm less interested in politicians and more in community members united with a common vision of how they can make their community more just and equitable. These are harder stories to tell. Telling stories this way breaks step with narratives as we're used to hearing them. Stories like this involve lots of people and these people often go unnamed. But these people are no less heroic for their anonymity. It takes strength to choose baskets over swords. Through and in and with the one who binds us together, we have the power to save. May God grant us flexibility. May God grant us humility. And may God fill us with good things that we might share them with the world. Amen.
response to God's word for us, please join me as we say what we believe using the words displayed on the screen and in today's bulletin from a declaration of faith. God has not taken his people out of the world, but has sent them into the world to worship him there and serve all humankind. We worship God in the world by standing before the Lord on behalf of all people. Our cries for help and our songs of praise are never for ourselves alone. Worship is no retreat from the world. It is part of our mission. We serve humankind by discerning what God is doing in the world and joining him in his work. We risk disagreement and error when we try to say what God is doing here and now but we find guidance in God's deeds in the past and his promises for the future as they are witnessed to in scripture. We affirm that the Lord is at work, especially in events and movements that free people by the gospel and advance justice, compassion, and peace. So we'd like to take a few moments to highlight a few announcements for the week. I'd like to say a personal word about our prayer list. You know, um, during COVID, it's occurred to me that we need to start seeing our prayer list maybe a little more dynamically. Often people have asked me um, what they can do for others in the congregation or the community. And more and more, I just find myself directing them to our prayer list. That's the place where you can know um, who is hurting or grieving or rejoicing. Um, you will see there um, what people have on their minds and hearts and are brave enough to ask for prayers. Prayers, as you know, can be things that we can say quietly um, in our hearts in all sorts of ways, bowing our heads or on our knees or just all sorts of ways. But prayers can also be enacted in the form of cards. Um, They're enacted when we advocate for justice or show up to serve or, or even show up to vote. Our prayer list I am coming to see is really a call to discipleship, and I'm hoping that you will join me in seeing it this way. <clears throat> it's a place where we can share ourselves and life together, especially during this time when we are not able to bump into each other in the courtyard before or after worship. If you would like a link to the email to the prayer list, please email me. We don't post um, names, full names in broadcasts like this for confidentiality and privacy purposes. But if you're a member of Westminster Presbyterian Church and want to have our prayer list, please email and I'll get email me and I'll get you connected in. And speaking of enacted prayers, um, as always, we need folks to help us with Iglesia Presbyteriana, Emmanuel, um, who are serving our neighbors in need with groceries each week. Mondays, we bag beans and rice, and Wednesdays, we deliver groceries to the trunks of vehicles. This truly is an enacted prayer of love and care for those in our community who are hurting. The latest COVID stats are telling us that one in 10 persons are out of work right now. And we know that um, our Latino and um, blacks and other black and brown people are, um, at, are affected at a higher percentage on this. On average, we are serving 350 households um, through this program each week. So your partnership is always helpful. There's a sign up genius for that in your bulletin. And please, if you have some time to give, help us out with that. Finally, I'd like to call your attention to the work and report of the regathering committee um, that, is, that is in our bulletin today. There is a lot there, um, more than I can in this brief announcement tell you, but it's work that's important to the life of our congregation, and I hope you will take some time to read it. It's there for the good of us all, and um, I hope you will give it a look sometime today. As we come to God with our prayers, let us bring our full minds and spirits to this time and place let us pray together. God of water and baskets and women who conspire to change the world, we thank you for all the ways you have made us so that we can bend and flex to meet the demands of our times. 
We thank you for the underestimated strength of those who may appear weak. The unexpected resourcefulness of those who seem to have their backs against the wall. And we pray that in our living, you will open our eyes to see this strength, this resourcefulness, to admire it and to honor it and to give it its glory. We pray that in our discipleship, we might even dare to see these things and love them in ourselves. Help us all, God of midwives and Pharaoh's daughters, to see the subversive possibilities that we have to knit the world back together rather than to tear it apart. Spirit who hovered in the heart of Moses' mother and sister and that crying baby boy among the reeds, move our hearts to compassion. Move us to see the futures of children the world would like to drown and to protect them, Lord to educate them and to give them a strong sense of their own self-worth so that they might grow to be our leaders of justice and freedom. In a COVID world that has put us in our place and told us not to move, Jesus, show us the ways to wiggle free. Show us the ways and all the places where the infection will not spread. Teach our hands how to form baskets of hope that will continue a future for us all. Use physical distance and mask and test tubes and test and treatments old and new, vaccines of every kind. Use Zoom and cards and neighbors we didn't know before. Use exercise and good books and meaningful poems. Use music. Use good Netflix shows. Use anything and everything to show us the great escape. Be with those most vulnerable, O Christ, especially those on our prayer list. The list is longer these days, but you know each name and every one by, by name. And you are not afraid of this prayer list length. And so pray for each one, Christ, Spirit of wisdom, God of all things, pray and may each person's name there know the power of your loving kindness. May each who are suffering know your help and each who are rejoicing know your laughter. May each and every one find strength in their weakness, joy in their endurance. And now hear us as we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, today we are invited to join Moses, his mother, his sister, and the Pharaoh's daughter at the edge of the water, where worlds meet and possibilities abound, to offer our own part in a larger basket of hope. Let us take some time now to quietly contemplate all that we have to offer, for your offerings of money, I remind you that there is a donate button on our website or you can send a check to the church. But let's take some time now to offer to God all that we are. Almighty God, you took a baby from the Nile River and used him to lead your people into the promised land. Take our offerings of money, service, prayer, and make of them a basket that will hold leaders you send to bring freedom to your land and throughout the world. Amen. Dear friends, we go out this day into a world that is full of suffering and in grave need of change. And we go out this day knowing that we are capable of making that change happen. We will not do this work alone. 
we will do it together. All of us joined in strength and solidarity, in humility and love, bound together by Christ, the master craftsman. I'm excited to see what we can make happen. So go with the love of Christ, the communion of the Holy Spirit, and the strength of God, the eternal creator, who loves us more than we can imagine. Amen. Go with us, Lord, and guide the way through this and every coming day, that in your Spirit, strong and true, our lives may be our gift to you.